Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Mr. Christopher McCrum will defend his academic thesis, A Trip to Remember, Assessing and Improving, improving Walking Stability in Older Adults. May I invite you to give a summary of your uh, and a presentation of your PhD thesis and your conclusions. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Prorector. Members of the Corona family, friends, colleagues, and members of the public, I'm pleased to present the results of my dissertation to you today on the topic of walking stability in older adults. I'll begin by describing the, the problem that the dissertation addresses, which is falls among older adults. Falls among older adults are unfortunately a very common occurrence, with about one third of adults over the age of 65 experiencing a fall in a given year. Over the age of 80, this increases to about one in two. Now, even in healthy community dwelling, healthy older adults, falls occur most often due to walking, uh, during walking, due to trips and slips, as indicated here. But it's not the act of falling itself that creates the problem, but rather the injuries and other consequences of falls. Among these, bone fractures, and in particular, hip fractures, are among the most devastating consequences. And it's a hip fracture that we see here in a long-term care home. As you can see, the woman trips on the floor, and despite an attempt to grasp the counter next to her and to take some kind of balance recovery step, these strategies are simply not sufficient to arrest her fall. And unfortunately, injuries related to falls and as well other issues in hospital admissions have been increasing in recent years. And here we see uh, data that, was, that recently made the news here in the Netherlands. Um, in the last 10 years, the rates of deaths due to falls in the Netherlands among older adults has risen in both men and women drastically. And last year alone, more than 4,500 people died as the result of consequences following a fall. So an average about 13 deaths per day in the Netherlands in 2018. So the question is, what can we do about this? What has been done and what can be done? Because many falls occur during walking and due to inefficient balance recovery responses, it could be that exercise uh, can play a role in improving these responses and reducing the risk of falls. Falling is often related to a decline in physical function, such as a reduction in muscle strength um, and slowed reaction time with aging. And therefore, it's not surprising that exercise in general is a very effective intervention to reduce falls. But among different types of exercise, there are a range of different effects. If we consider very typical traditional exercise like resistance exercise, aerobics, normal balance training, on average across multiple studies, this results in about a 20% reduction of falls in healthy older adults. However, if we have people doing very challenging back balance exercise or extended durations of exercise per week, for example, more than three hours per week, then these positive effects increase further. More recent studies have also shown that interventions training stepping, for instance, balance recovery steps or step adaptability type training, may be even more effective. And more importantly, these interventions don't necessarily require the long durations that other types of exercise require. And so this may be a much more efficient approach. And that leads us to the concept of task-specific assessment and training of falls risk. So you see here a video from an ongoing study here in Maastricht, where participants experience multiple different balance challenges during walking, as you can see, and they have to cope with these disturbances and continue walking. And by performing this kind of training and assessment, both in research and in clinical settings, we hope that we can gain more insight into how more, to more specifically assess falls risk and to improve falls risk in a specific manner that might uh, translate to daily life. So the overall aim of my dissertation was to understand how old age affects walking stability and adaptability with the perspective that this might inform more effective falls prevention. In the studies in this thesis, stability was analyzed by looking at the stability of the body configuration. And to do this, we look at the relationship between the center of mass and the base of support. Specifically, this means the virtual point at the center of the body weight, how that relates to 
in this case the feet on the ground, whether it's inside indicating stability or outside indicating temporary instability. Adaptability in this thesis was analysed by looking at how people respond to repeated large balance disturbances and if the response was able to be refined and improved over time. And also this includes the ability to transfer adaptations made to other similar tasks, such as a task with a similar overall effect on the body or a disturbance to a different leg. So I will now summarise the results of the thesis uh, that dealt with the ability to cope with large balance disturbances during walking, particularly focusing on the age effects. So here you can see a video of how we challenged people's walking during balance. And what actually happens here is that one part of the treadmill suddenly accelerates during walking, causing the participant to fall forwards. And then they have to respond by taking recovery steps. What we then analysed was look at the steps following the recovery. So the first step and then up to the first eight recovery steps. And we measured the stability during this time in order to assess on average how long or how many steps it took people to recover from these disturbances. And you can see here our experimental protocol. The disturbance that you just saw was repeated uh, as follows. The first was applied to the right leg and then after 30 to 90 seconds of normal walking again, it was applied to the left leg. And the left leg disturbances were then repeated eight times with again 30 to 90 seconds in between, meaning that people had difficulty or it was almost impossible to predict when a per uh, disturbance was coming. At the end of this protocol, the disturbance was then applied to the right leg again. And there are three, th three things that this protocol can help us address. Firstly, we want to know uh, about people's walking stability on the first time that they're exposed to a disturbance. So in this case, the first time the right leg is disturbed and the first time the left leg is disturbed. The repetitions to the left leg give us an indication of adaptability to the uh, disturbance by looking at how people perform at the end of this period versus at the beginning. And by comparing the two disturbances to the right leg, we can see whether, whether or not there's a change which would indicate people can transfer what they've learned on the left leg disturbances to benefit performance following a disturbance to the right leg. So I'll now summarise the results from these three different uh, concepts. And the first uh, perturbation to each leg uh, indicated that older adults need more recovery steps in order to return to their uh, normal walking stability. Specifically, we found that younger adults for this particular disturbance needed about six recovery steps to return to their normal walking, whereas older adults needed eight or more recovery steps uh, to get back to their original level. And this was despite us ensuring that the initial conditions of walking and the stability were similar. The repetitions, however, indicated that older adults showed more improvement than younger adults uh, to this task. And you can see here the older adults demonstrated approximately three steps of improvement. In other words, they were able to return to their normal walking three steps sooner than before the adaptation, <laughs> whereas the younger adults only improved by one step. With regards to the transfer of the adaptation, the steps after the right leg disturbances showed no clear difference in the younger adults. However, in the older adults, we again saw the same three-step improvement that we saw on the repeated disturbances to the left limb. And these results combined um, indicate that the young adults may be already close to their optimal performance and therefore might not need to improve, whereas the older adults who were initially much less stable um, had a greater need for the improvement and then indeed were able to do so. In another study, we looked at how people adapt to sustained disturbance. So you can see in the video, a cable attached to the ankle is applying resistance for 18 steps in a row. So rather than suddenly disturbing and then releasing, this was a constant disturbance. And this was applied for 18 steps in a young adult group, a middle-aged adult group, and an older adult group. And what we found was the older adults were initially slower to adapt to this uh, disturbance but by the end of the 18 steps, there were no longer any age differences. 
So again, it shows that the older adults were capable of adapting and improving, just that in this case, they did it at a slower rate. So to summarize the uh, conclusions of the balance disturbance studies, the ability to adapt walking following balance loss is preserved with aging. But how quickly adaptation can occur may decline with aging, depending on the type of disturbance encountered. Secondly, the extent of adaptation following balance loss might reflect a necessity rather than ability. And that's an important difference because you may also conclude from our studies that older adults are more adaptable, but because they start from a different point, this might not necessarily be the case. So I'll now go on to outline some future steps in research and application uh, with regards to assessing and improving walking stability. Regarding research, it's well established from this work and previous work that older adults, no matter their age, if healthy, always have the potential to improve their walking stability. And this is positive for our training interventions because we know that most people will respond positively. However, these adaptations are shown in a specific task or training setting. What's less well understood is how we can optimize how to transfer these improvements and adaptations gained in the lab or the clinic to daily life. And this is what really matters if we want to reduce falls risk. And this again is the situation here. We know that we can improve people in one specific situation using nice technology, but we don't know how to really optimize uh, reducing the risk in, in daily life. And this is even more so in certain clinical populations where, for instance, balance control or the ability to adapt motor control is affected. And in our case in this thesis, we focus on one particular group with balance problems, and that's bilateral vestibulopathy. On the screen, you see the, uh, the vestibular labyrinth, and this is our balance organ. It gives our brain a sense of the way our head is moving in space. And patients with bilateral vestibulopathy have a bilateral loss of function in this organ. Uh, and this leads to severe balance and gait problems, including falls. And in one study where we looked at walking variability, so in other words, how consistent uh, people step uh, in this thesis, we compared young, healthy, older, healthy uh, people and uh, patients with bilateral vestibulopathy. And here you can see uh, an example of what these results look like. You see very consistent stepping patterns in young and older adults, but with bilateral vestibulopathy, the variability in both the timing, length, and width of steps is significantly declined. And therefore, we need to continue to work on ways that we can assess uh, and improve walking stability in such patient groups. Regarding application, you can see here a hypothetical plot where there's an increasing challenge on the left side and an increasing specificity to falls uh, on the bottom. And here you see a typical progression when we think of balance training, and this is often how it's done, where tasks begin with two legs, then you progress to standing on one leg, you maybe add an unstable surface, and then also you can add small disturbances that people have to compensate for. And there's no doubt that this is progressive and increases the challenge and people can improve on these tasks. But this approach with regards to falls prevention misses a step, specifically it misses stepping. Tasks such as walking over uneven ground, um, while not dealing with large balance disturbances, um, are much more specific to the situations that can lead to falls. And additionally, the more intensive uh, large disturbances during standing and walking are even more similar to the real situations that lead to falls and the fall-related consequences we want to prevent. So for application, we need to try and find ways both through research and education as well as technology um, to make this easier to do in clinical and applied settings, whether that be with nice technology or finding solutions that can be applied in, in simple setups. So that concludes my summary of this research. Uh, thank you very much for your attendance and attention, and I hand the floor back to the Pro-Rector. Thank you very much for your clear presentation. The opposition will now be opened by um, the Chair of the Assessment Committee, Professor Van Merle. Mm -hmm. He is Professor of Child Neurology at Maastricht University. Professor Van Merle. Dear candidate, <coughs> first of all, I would compliment you with your results. Uh, addressing a difficult topic as falling an elder is really a challenge and 
you also did a great job on a new device where we had many struggles and, and troubles and, and the, it was not only the, the your uh, sequences that stopped but the apparatus stopped itself for whatever reason so you did a great job and i think also for the promotion team and all the people that helped you getting this uh, done i think it's a real big compliment of course we have uh, other things to discuss and uh, i had so, uh, several questions and um, um, I, I was uh, struck by the, the table you showed in your uh, in your presentation you indicated that uh, one third of the patient of the uh, the normal population has problems but in poland for instance they have 70 percent disturbance of falling so maybe some regional differences can you comment on that first of all Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for the compliments uh, and the question. Um, yeah, the table you refer to in the introduction looks at studies from many different countries, and in some of those situations, the incidence is indeed extremely high. Um, when gathering that information, I try to include only larger trials because if you only have a, a small popul small sample in the studies, then this can uh, yeah influence the the findings. Um, for that study in particular, yeah, I. Right now, I can't remember the details of why that might have been so high, but it is indeed possible, depending on the population you look at. Um, those studies in the table are all including healthy older adults, mm -hmm. but in some cases, that was not clinically assessed. It was self-reported. Okay. It could be, therefore, that some of these studies included people with uh, either undiagnosed or undeclared disorders where falls risk could increase. Okay. Um, could be one explanation. Okay. So we go further with in chapter six, you indicate that gait variability seems to be a potential marker for s vestibular dysfunction. That's in your abstract. And then in your uh, discussion, you indicate that uh, sensory driven balance control is out favored by feed forward control and increasing locomotive speed. Can you elaborate on that conclusion? Because it was to me uh, <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. Um, if I understood correctly, you're asking how the walking speed affects? No, variables. no. why this, this sensory driven balance control? Because I'm, I'm a neurologist, <coughs> so what I would think that uh, sensory systems are uh, getting older and uh, yeah. they're explaining some of the difference you find, yeah. but for one reason you indicated that it's not really true, so there's yeah. a new yeah. kit on the... Yeah, well, I think it, it depends on the walking speeds because um, the faster you walk, the less time there is to incorporate the sensory feedback into the feed forward signal. And so we also see that in the, the vestibular patients that while walking very slowly, there are much larger differences between patients with sensory dysfunction and, and not. Mm -hmm. And so it seems to be an effect of the, um, the walking speed um, where the deficit in the sensory systems becomes less important the faster the person is walking. Um, where more automatic processes take over. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when you look at the gait analysis as a tool for to investigate vestibular dysfunction, you also correlated the vestibular functions that were analyzed by your colleague of the audiology department, of vestibular uh, department, but they don't correlate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, one reason why we included that analysis was because uh, from from our clinicians and uh, from the experience working with the patients, the deficits they experience in daily life and the limitations that they experience are not fully explained by those typical clinical tests. And so they somehow miss something. And so in that study, we wanted to check if that's indeed the case, if the gait variability measure is telling us something that the clinical tests of vestibular function can't. And it's probably because during walking, we have different uh, vestibulospinal reflexes at mm -hmm. play and these are not necessarily specifically tested when we do a head impulse test uh, or we do a dynamic visual acuity test which focuses more on the vestibular ocular reflex. And, and do you mean that your your results of the, the gait variability better correlate with the clinical reports of the patients? At least um, the what we found was that the people who were more active and less affected in terms of uh, mobility were also the ones who could complete all walking speeds and who had lower gait variability than the other patients. Mm -hmm. So it, yeah, 
that was only the first study, so it's hard to say conclusively, but it definitely seems to reflect the limitations of <coughs> daily life. And now look at the limitation of your system, because what we experience is that several uh, people um, got nauseous on the system itself, and, and do you have to adapt to the system, which is huge. And also what we know is that also in children, uh, that the speeds is lower in, the, in the, these kind of apparatus. How do it refers to overground speed? Yeah. <coughs> and in this specific patient group, we didn't measure the same people <coughs> overground and on the treadmill. So f for this specific group, I can't say. We know that with healthy older, uh, healthy older adults, there are very minor, probably not clinically meaningful differences between these outcomes overground and on the treadmill. But speed is different. Speed is indeed different, um, but that's why we elected to choose uh, to use fixed walking speeds and not preferred walking speeds, because then the preferred walking speeds wouldn't necessarily represent daily life. But mm -hmm. we tried to measure a range of fixed speeds that would try and capture as much of what could be done in daily life as possible. Okay, good. Um, I will go further on chapter 4.1, and um, you report about the reactive gait habitations after perturbation. And I think from a developmental perspective, these interventions are very interesting. And my first question is about your choice for laterality. Why did you start always with the right leg? Um, and, and, and was it related? Do, do you know more about these people? Were they right-handed or left-handed? Or no. um, we, There was no specific reason to start with right versus left. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, obviously we wanted to stimulate adaptation only in one limb and then check if it transferred. Um, we checked the literature beforehand. Uh, there is one study in existence that looked to see if limb dominance affected stability control during such perturbations, and they found no difference. Mm -hmm. um, this agreed with our thinking and our experience in previous studies. We don't see large effects in healthy people, and this is probably related to the fact that walking is a bipedal task. And as well, the recovery from such perturbations requires both legs, of course. The one is uh, disturbed, mm -hmm. um, but the following recovery steps are equally as important to return. So I think this is why there is possibly very small, subtle effects, but they're not measurable at the movement level. Perhaps okay. if we look at EMG or something on, uh, deeper, then we would see a difference. Yeah. And you showed your nice results. And um, I was thinking, did you look... What we know, of course, is that gait can, can be analyzed and, and described as uh, spinal complexes. And do you have any idea whether your perturbations training changed the, per, uh, the, the spinal complexes after the intervention? Yeah, this is something obviously we can't confirm. Uh, we know that there are two previous studies uh, in infants prior to independent walking where they looked at uh, foot withdrawal reflexes. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, Pang and colleagues and Lam and colleagues, 2003. And they did see a modulation of this reflex response over time. So that would suggest that the spinal centers themselves can also modulate. Whether or not that's still present in freely walking adults, I can't say. Um, but it certainly could play a part in, in the, the overall adaptive behavior. OK. Um, one more question. And um, now you have done this, all this, um, of course you want to do the interventions and you showed the intervention. Do you think it is the most probable, what, what you showed the intervention you are doing, you think this is the most probable intervention or can well, you? I should first say that the intervention shown is, is not my own study, that's the study of uh, another PhD mm -hmm. student, Marissa Gerhard. Um, yeah, and th there are many things still to investigate before we can say what is the best intervention um, and what necessarily leads to strong adaptation acutely is not necessarily the same thing that transfers to daily, to daily life. Yeah. And, and, uh, and one of the things that I asked you in the, in the beginning about the sensory different con balance control is the fact that when you uh, use fibro, uh, uh, fibroelectric uh, stimulation, in a belt, that really uh, in, in walking patients with vestibular uh, dysfunction cause an improvement in their function. So my question, do you still believe that sensory driven control is not important? Or? 
Well, what I can say about those results, um, in those particular patients, there are also many psychological effects that affect anxiety about movement and walking. And what's shown in one of the early studies with the vibrotactile belt is that people felt much more comfortable walking. They felt safer and secure because they had this feedback that they were not used to getting. Whether that's useful for these very fast, rapid disturbances, I'm not sure. Um, I don't think it's quick enough. It may help normal steady state walking by giving more information that they do have time to respond to, but when a very fast, sudden perturbation happens, then I'm not sure how much uh, vibrotactile feedback can assist. However, it could help with the training, which mm -hmm. then would have a knock-on effect. And, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, and I'm really glad with the answers, and please give the word back to the Pro-Rector. Thank you. The next opponent is Professor Kersting. He is affiliated with the Institute of Biomechanics and Orthopedics at the German Sport University, um, at the German Sport University in Cologne, in Germany. Please, Dr. Kersting. Thank you. I can do nothing more but uh, confirm the compliments you received beforehand. So it was a very nice work, very comprehensive, um, and very well presented here at this um, defense. My question, my first question is rather, let's say, overarching or methodological um, because it affects all, all of the studies. When you establish your assessment of stability, you use rather linear measures, meaning anterior, posteriorly, mainly. Um, your perturbations, however, are applied off-center, which would then potentially induce rotatory movements and then deviate from that linear walking pattern we typically assume when we ambulate from place to place. Do you think that that is yeah, a limitation, a shortcoming, or how would you potentially change this in future studies? That would be the first. Thank you. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for the compliments and the question. Um, yes, about the disturbance, of course you're correct. The treadmill belt is anterior-posterior, but the foot during walking is not perfectly centered for that whole acceleration. So, of course, the body does have some, some rotations. Um, in the, the final study with the older adults, we checked both the anterior, posterior, and mediolateral um, margins of stability. Um, our primary outcome was always the anterior, posterior, um, because that is where the, the loss of balance is generally directed, if we categorize it that way. Um, in the mediolateral, we didn't see differences between age, um, and also we didn't see any adaptation. And that would lead me to think that for this particular perturbation, the rotation that might cause changes in mediolateral stability weren't enough to require an adaptive response. However, um, you, you are correct, of course, it's an oversimplification to measure just in, in one plane. Um, yeah, I, I, so I think definitely there are changes that could be accounted for, but whether that changes the, the overall outcome, I'm, I, I don't think so, but... I'm not sure if that completely answers yeah, your that, question. Yeah, that is fine. Yeah. Um, we also talked about uh, velocity dependence. Um, yeah. I guess, as you also just indicated, that um, the effects of the um, off-center perturbations would be larger if you walk faster, and therefore the perturbation would have a, a stronger effect. And you could see it basically on the video which you showed that in the first perturbation where you had the linear, like as you state, the linear perturb perturbation, uh, the patient or subject, well, was healthy, I guess, um, did actually um, a rotatory um, movement out of plane. So I'm not sure if the pulling the belt backward is really linear. But that, that's yeah. only a, a remark, and it will be depending on, on velocity, obviously. Um, do you think that this could be 
described by a different measure of stability? I mean, would you just add the anterior, posterior, or medial lateral, or would it require some sort of combined measure? Or um, Currently in the literature, usually these planes are split. Um, there is, uh, I think, one paper that looked at the planar margin of stability, so they rather from looking from anterior, posterior, medial lateral, they take a, a bird's eye view and can look at the, yep. the area. Um, however, the, the inverted pendulum doesn't move in this way, so that's also a, an oversimplification. I think the, the pendular motion in medial lateral and AP is reasonably consistent, consistent enough that it serves as a model. Um, how we combine that uh, right, right now, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not aware of an established model for that, at least during these acute um, perturbations where we look at the stability of the body configuration. Then, um, if, if we switch to a slightly different area, um, it was touched before, and it is stated in your introduction that, um, like it was from some older literature, how will 1988, where they state, well, if you watch walking and stumbling, then you can see that the reflexes are slow. Um, how slow are reflexes? Are they relevant when you stumble? Or is it rather reaction time? Like, which, you, that is another term you mention. Like, yeah. how do they relate? And what are the magnitudes you would expect for reaction time and uh, reflex response? Yeah. I think functionally the overall reaction time to perform the recovery movement is what's really relevant. Um, and that is made up of different things. Um, yeah, the quickest reactions can be in the 50 to 100 millisecond range for the initial reflex, but yeah, I'm not sure how much they um, contribute to the overall functional movement. Um, we know that the overall movements are slower, so the reaction time to make the first uh, correction to the perturbation and the overall recovery, at least in some perturbations, is slower in older adults, even if they are healthy. Um, but yeah, overall, uh, uh, I, can't, I, th I think the re difference in reflex magnitude, if there is modulation occurring, is probably not enough to explain the, the functional differences mm. that are seen. How much time do you have to like, what is the swing phase of walking gait? Like, would, uh, th th would that be over 100 milliseconds or? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. Ab about, right. uh, yeah, between 0.3 and a half a second, I, I would suppose, but that, it would depend on the type of perturbation and, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Do you know of any um, reflex, I mean, if you, t if you talk reflexes, then uh, we talk monosynaptic reflexes? Between uh, like within one muscle, do you know of any um, pathways which would include other segments? Yeah. Or well, yeah. Work from your own lab in Alberg, uh, Garvasio and colleagues did a lot on the SELR, the short cross latency reflex. Um, as far as I know, there's not work looking at how that adapts to such whole body perturbations. Um, but there is work showing that yeah, the ipsilateral and in, in that case, uh, nerve stimulation has uh, yeah, a link to the response seen in the contralateral uh, soleus muscle. And in the case of a trip where uh, you know, one leg is disturbed, then that could then uh, provide this initial reflex in the recovery limb. Um, yeah, but as I say, I'm, I'm, I don't know of work uh, that shows the modulation of that in, in grown adults. So I'm not sure how much it contributes to the adaptation and the whole body response that we see. Mm. Okay. And then um, finally, like if, if there is a, train, a training, if, like, uh, there must be some training effect, like as you show. Um, do you think that is rather a neural thing, or is the mechanics, the muscle mechanics, more important than um, in that recovery process? I think it's a combination. Um, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the previous PhD work of uh, Dr. April <laughs> has shown that during repeated tripping perturbations, there is a refinement in the EMG response of the Stanslim tricep suri, where in the initial perturbation, the EMG activity is very wide, and with the repetitions, it becomes much more specific, and the peak becomes clearer. So there's definitely a refinement. Um, where that refinement comes from, um, yeah, it could partly be modulation of stretch reflexes in the calf that could assist that, but again, that's not been directly shown. Um, it could be a rearrangement of the motor modules, but again, in this type of task, that's not yet been shown. <laughs> People are working on that. Mm -hmm. um, and it could also be um, related to the initial detection from the sensory systems, um, which, of course, then awareness also plays a role. Once somebody has been disturbed once, then... Yeah, they might not know the timing of, of what when the next one is coming, but there can then be a, a change in the, the sensory input. Yeah. So what you're saying is basically what you stated before. There's a lot of research to be done. Yes. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. And Maastricht University appreciates your membership as an external member of the assessment committee and of this degree committee today. The next opponent is Professor Pijnappels. She is Professor of Mobility in Aging at the Department of Human Movement Sciences of the Free University in Amsterdam. Please, you, Professor Pijnappels. Dear candidate, I would like to continue on the discussion, but uh, first, of course, I want to congratulate you with this impressive uh, piece of work, uh, both in quantity and quality. Uh, you did uh, tremendous uh, work. And I also want to congratulate your supervising team. Um, I think you did a, did a good teamwork uh, and resulted in a series of really impressive uh, studies um, on uh, methodological and mechanical solutions. You've been really creative in uh, uh, trying to apply all, uh, new solutions uh, to, um, um, to see whether and how people can uh, increase the stability and adaptability and prevent falls in the long end. I didn't come here just for compliments, I also come here for uh, some critical questions and um, uh, specifically on the measure that you use to describe uh, stability, which is the margin of stability. Uh, but first I want to ask you a little bit about the cover of your thesis, uh, because um, it looks uh, quite a challenging environment, also by the, the number of pedestrians that we see and, uh, and the average age of the people on the cover. Uh, I think uh, this, this must be a really challenging uh, um, pavement. And I wonder whether this picture is based on a true memorable trip for you. And if so, um, when walking in this particular challenging environment, how did or would you uh, adapt your gait in order not to trip and or fall? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for the compliments uh, and for the question. Uh, this is not a photo from me. Um, it comes from the internet. <laughs> I actually found this photo at the very beginning of my PhD when I was looking for a nice uh, yeah, presentation background. Um, and as you say, I, I like this because the, there's a, an unstable background. You see people of young, middle and older age uh, all walking, uh, carrying objects. So it represents a lot of daily life challenges that might lead to falls. Uh, to your question, um, if walking in such an environment, assuming everything is healthy, um, then obviously careful foot placement is important, which requires vision, attention, um, and perhaps depending on the height of the cobblestones, an increase in step height. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So careful foot yeah. placement. Uh, would that also have, um, would you also uh, change your walking speed? Maybe. Uh, yes, potentially a bit slower, uh, depending on yeah, the height and. Yeah, yeah. So how would your speed changes then affect your careful foot placement, if we come to that specific specific measure of margins of stability? Yeah. Well, if you reduce your speed, then your velocity going forwards is reduced. And that means that the, your center of mass position accounting for that velocity is then closer to your own body, meaning that when you step, you don't need to step as far to counteract the forward motion of the inverted pendulum. So in this case, if somebody was to catch their foot on a cobblestone mm. and was walking faster rather than slower, they would have to produce a much larger recovery step in order to catch themselves versus if they were walking slower. 
Right. So you've shown also in, in, in the new measure that you uh, of the normalized, uh, the stability normalized uh, gate speed uh, chapter, chapter 3.2, you already also showed that the, the margin of stability um, is much larger in slow walking and becomes even negative in, in fast walking. Um, does that imply that uh, fast walking is less stable? Uh, yeah, this is a big question and it really depends what we mean when we say stability. And yeah, there are different definitions. Uh, if we're talking about just the mechanical stability at an instant uh, a freeze frame in time, uh, then yes, in, in that moment you are less stable um, because the pendulum will continue to fall forward at a higher velocity. But um, I have a task. I also have to move forward in a certain velocity, maybe to catch my train or... So, um, and we know also from literature uh, that faster walking in terms of the trunk uh, control, motor control, is um, a faster walking is more stable. So yes. how, do you co how do you combine these two types of definitions of stability? Um, it's situational. Um, so the, yeah, what you refer to is then the stability of the walking pattern itself or the, the repetitive motion. And yeah, for efficiency, obviously then, Reducing the, the variability in sway and the deviation of the center of mass is then important. Um, so it then depends on the environment that, that you're in, uh, what stability you might prioritize. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that completely answers your question. Well, yeah, there's, there's a bit of a trade-off, of course. So, yeah. so walking uh, faster is more stable, like cycling. You may have noticed all these Dutch people cycling <laughs> around. Um, if you cycle really, really slow, just like walking really, really slow, it becomes less stable. But indeed, in terms of when you uh, get perturbed, uh, you have more time to respond and to make a quicker step. Well, I want to move on and take this as a bridge to uh, the outcomes of the uh, study that you did and described in chapter 4.2, where you have all the results uh, tripped on a treadmill. Uh, no, not tripped, you perturbed them on a treadmill. Uh, by accelerations of the of the belt, um, and you again use the margin of stability as the outcome to describe well their ability to uh, respond to those uh, um, recovery, um, and again I wonder whether that gives you the information about the mechanistics uh, the, the, or the, the mechanisms that people use to uh, to really um, uh, recover from these perturbations because using the margin of stability you have actually just or just 12 uh, or 10 instances in time at the heel strikes where you define stability but not a continuous measure am i correct that's correct okay <laughs> so then you disturb them um by accelerations and uh to to understand how people uh, respond you really have to take them out of the comfort zone like you say in your proposition uh, number nine, um, you really have to make a, a, a large perturbation. But I wonder whether you really challenged them enough because everyone was um, able to recover their balance um, and whether your margins of stability give you a good idea of whether there was actually a diff difference between the two age groups. When looking more specific, when looking at uh, figure three on page um, uh, figure two on uh, uh, page uh, 119, um, you see the difference in the anterior posterior um, margin of stability in the first step, um, where older adults even have a much larger margin of stability in the first step, um, and then they go a little bit down. So that seems as a different strategy they use uh, in terms of also speed negotiation. Can you maybe explain a little bit their strategy they use and how that differed from um, coming to different margins of stability in the young adults? Yeah, yeah thank you for the questions. You may um, give a short mm -hmm. answer, please. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, this difference in strategy was unexpected based on the previous studies from our group with the cable trip. We saw quite consistent strategy across age groups. The strategy here, when we look at the components of the margin of stability, was that the older adults maintained a more posterior extrapolated center of mass and otherwise they didn't let themselves fall as far forward with their trunk as the younger adults. The younger adults actually did let themselves fall forward more, uh, therefore initially becoming negative right away. Um, and the older adults made this uh, 
Uh, it wasn't a backward rotation, but they let their extrapolated center of the mass not move as anteriorly. And our thinking was that this is a prioritization of preventing the fall, but not continuing walking. Um, but would they, would they be just as, well, uh, or needing just uh, more steps when they had uh, uh, been perturbed by overground walking? Uh, no, then it would have been indeed different. So they would could just have changed their speed um, and continue. Yeah, and this is of course a limitation of doing these on a fixed speed treadmill because the people have to keep walking. But indeed all of the participants here took an initial recovery step sufficient to prevent a fall. Nobody needed the, the harness. Okay, thank you for your answers. Thank you. And Maastricht University also grateful to you for your uh, contributions to the assessment committee and the committee of today. The next opponent is Professor Savelberg. He is professor of education that moves you in, at Maastricht University. Professor Savelberg. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Dear candidate, um, I also want to congratulate you <coughs> with the complete completion of your uh, thesis. Um, I think you developed some very nice and intelligent studies. Um, and also like your, your, the way you presented your, your graphs, they were very well designed. Sometimes they were a bit complicated and challenging to understand, but there was a lot of information in it and I liked it very much. And I was also impressed by the incredible, incredible amount of your number of publications and it's um, really a compliment. And what is even more important is that when you look at these um, publications, you see that you're not the first author in all these uh, studies. And I think that shows that you are very willing to, to help others and, and collaborate with them. That's, that's, I think that's very good for an investigator. But as mentioned already, we're not here only for the compliments, but also to ask some questions. Um, and I would like to ask you to ask one of your paranyms to uh, read the second proposition. Capacity to adapt in response to mechanical perturbations is preserved with aging, but how quickly adaptation can occur may decline with aging. Thank you. I think this, this proposition shows that you think that aging is, is an important aspect of, of falling, and at several places in your thesis you, you talk about, um, that you say that you want to know the age-related mechanisms of falling. Um, when I, when I hear this thesis, uh, th this proposition, and uh, read your thesis, I'm not sure whether that's completely true, whether it's age-related. You show that there is adaptation does not decrease or disappear with aging. So when you, you train people, they can still adapt. So I, w I was wondering if you can reach these similar margins of stability when you're when you're at a certain age, is it aging or is it is it disuse? Can you comment on that? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for the compliments uh, and the question. Um, yes, the the effect, the age effect. I think you're correct to say that it's not purely age alone. Um, it's definitely partly disuse and inactivity with age. Uh, as people get older, there's you know, a well-known decline in physical activity. And this means that the mechanisms for controlling balance are not being exercised as much as they perhaps used to be. Um, however, there are also studies in using challenging balance perturbations that compare master athletes with younger adults. And there, there are still differences, not as much as we might see with the typical older healthy populations like in this thesis. But there are some parts of the system that contributes to balance control that uh, are still, still show differences even when people maintain a high level of physical activity. So I think and, it's and definitely part of the How was this in your population? I see that there is a, yeah. is a difference in the BMI of the yeah. younger and older people. So, so you could also have argued for in this uh, second uh, chapter that it's not aging, but it's BMI that, that causes the effects. And did you also look at whether these, your participants are similarly active in daily life, whether they participate in, in sports, have challenging um, work environments? Yeah. 
Yeah, our criteria for the, the studies in this thesis were that people should be normally active, they should not be athletes competing in competitive sport, and they should be able to walk for 30 minutes without stopping. So th those were the criteria. And the idea was that we would have a population that was representative of a general community dwelling, independent, healthy, older adult. Um, more detailed than that, we, we don't know. Um, yeah, anecdotally, I can say that the majority of the participants participated in walking or fitness-related sports uh, just for their own recreation. Um, so, yeah. That's and are, are these, if, if you talk about what I would call fit elderly, are they representative for, for the lady that you showed us on, on the movie, a tripping in this, in this hospital? Uh, in this situation, not. No, the, the studies uh, that led to these uh, video data collection were from three long-term care homes. So these are not typical, healthy, community-dwelling older people. Mm -hmm. um, they may be physically fit. There are also people in those homes uh, with cognitive deficits rather than physical. So this video you see is not the typical healthy older yeah, adult. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, but, but when we can conclude it's not only aging, but especially also disuse might be. Definitely partly, yeah. yeah. So, so my, maybe that might be a means for an intervention. And that, that brings me to my second question, and that relates to chapter five. And uh, since you brought two par and emphasis, uh, I would suggest would like to ask you whether the, the other could uh, read proposition number four. Evidence-based guidelines on how we can most efficiently and optimally train long-lasting generalizable gait adaptations that will reduce the risk of falls in daily life must be established. Okay, so, so I can agree with you that um, evidence-based interventions are important. When I read on page 161, your, your conclusion in the first sentence, it says, PBT appears to be a feasible approach to reduce falls among older adults in clinical settings. And then when I, re I read this chapter, chapter 5.5, .5, I was wondering what the evidence for this conclusion is. How do you do, do you come to this, yeah. <laughs> this sentence on page 161? Now, with regards to the feasibility, this uh, chapter five was a review article, um, basically looking at all of the studies that have applied this type of training. Uh, the type of training varied, but the majority of studies were small, uh, often pilot and feasibility based, and the main criteria for the feasibility was the adherence and the completion of the training and whether therapists could deliver such training in various applied environments. Um, and there were no studies that had an issue with this particular fact. Yeah, whether or not this is also effective in these populations, in some populations, remains to be seen. But in the, the studies included in that review, they were certainly feasible, if the right equipment okay, was... Okay, so, so, so that's maybe my, my understanding of English, but when you say feasible, it's, can we do it? And it's, you're not talking about effectiveness? No. Uh, and some of these studies you, you talked about, it's not statistically uh, significant, but there is clinical relevance. I think that, that that's a very vague term, but, but, but when we're talking about effectiveness, um, can you imagine that the kind of trainings that were shown in the studies, that they have an effect? That have the kind of effects that they showed? There are, one of the studies had 24 perturbations, and then they showed effects that last a year. I'm not I'm sure whether you participate in sport or help people to become, to learn some motor skills, but yep. my experience is that it works differently. What do, what do you think? Um, I think that your question depends on the type of motor skill. I think not all motor skills are, are learned and retained in the same way. I think, yeah, if, if we look at sports, then there's a particular skill you want to learn for a goal. But when people are exposed to this sudden balance loss, it's quite a shock to the system, and there has to be a response in order to prevent a fall. And I think that stimulus for adaptation is certainly part of the reason for these long-lasting adaptations. It causes a stimulus for the people to change their internal representation of their, their movement in that, in that situation. Um, yeah, the, the studies that show these effects in, in daily life falls, there are not many so far, but the long-term studies 
purely in the laboratory to also show that these effects are quite okay. robust over time. Well, well, given the time, it's a point that we very much would like to discuss with you, but maybe in another yeah. occasion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the next opponent is Professor Lenzin. He is also, <coughs> like the other members here, members of the, a member of the assessment committee. He is Professor of Clinical Physiotherapy at Maastricht University. Professor Lenzen. Dear candidate, of course, I follow my uh, predecessors stating that you uh, did a very nice uh, study. I want to compliment you on this and, of course, I want to add your team in the compliments. Um, very nice uh, thesis with a lot of different studies, systematic reviews, fundamentals research and patients uh, research. Um, but of course, I have some questions for you also. And the, uh, the questions will follow up a bit on what uh, Professor Saverberg already asked you, because you state, and I'm a bit older than you, so of course I'm triggered that older people, although starting a little bit off worse, tend to improve even better than younger patients. And um, and then there's something else you, you wrote, that older patients, um, there, there's an interlimb transfer in older patients that's not, a, not there in younger patients. So older patients do better all the way, I think. Um, you described it earlier very nicely. Um, in older patients, there might be a necessity to improve, in younger patients, not. But older patients tend to improve let's say 30%, younger patients 12%, do you really think it's a necessity or are there other explanations for the much larger improvement in older adults compared to younger? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for the compliments and the question. Um, yeah, the question gets back to what I said about the initial response being different. So we, we can't directly compare the, the rate or the magnitude of, of the improvement between groups, we can only say in one group we see so much improvement, and in another group we see this. Um, I don't see a reason why, or at least I can, you know, I can't think of a reason why older adults would be specifically, in absolute terms, better at adapting than younger adults. Um, as I said, I think the differences we see are out of, yeah, you know, perhaps necessity, or also it could be comfort with being out of balance. Young people who are very active and are used to moving more, doing sports, being out of balance, their tolerance then for an adaptation might be different. I can't think of, in absolute terms, a reason why older adults should adapt better than young adults. Well, because they might need it in the future, or in the near, nearer future. Uh, so sorry, can you repeat? The well, they, but they, they are they are the ones falling. Yes. So perhaps they are adjusting to get being becoming a faller. Yeah, and I think that yeah. In in the situations where they become out of balance, then yeah, we we can with such perturbations definitely improve those. But for instance, I don't think on average they would ever perform better than young adults. We could bring them up to the same level, but I don't think there's any capacity there to get them beyond the the level of the young adults. I would agree, but I'm not sure if that's addressing your. No, point. I would agree with that, of course. Okay. But I found a necessity for all the patients and for all the persons. Well, I, I don't know if it's necessary to be well to to improve more than younger patients. I would uh, I would feel uh, that it would be more difficult for me to get to improve than for. A younger person yeah, like you. And, and I understand your point. Um, I think that specifically means if uh, the initial disturbance is the same, hmm. then there might be necessity if the response is, is okay. less stable. Yeah. Um, well, and I'll skip a few questions because of time. Um, but you, in your, dis in your general discussion, um, there are many unanswered questions. And as Professor uh, Savelberg already mentioned, um, Perturbation-based training is a very yeah, short training, although in Chapter 5, um, Shimana study, they did 10 hours of perturbation training, leading to non-significant effects, which is quite odd to me. Um, so this is a fact, 
and in your in your presentation you showed us that well the, the main training that's out there now is let's say in, in holland it's um well how it's called um fallen valide tijd no? falls our history um they're typically strength balance functional training and you showed us that an improvement of 50 percent is possible in that training and then, of course, when you do two or three sessions or 10 hours of perturbation training, there's another 30, 40%. Uh, what, what, what should we aim for? What would be the future? Go further on, and in your discussion, you discuss this also. Should we be very specific in our future training? Or should we, should we be very general, do everything, and then reach, let's say, 70 or 80% increase in, in, in a false prediction. That's indeed a, a very good question. Um, and I think that the, the answer depends on many things. Um, what we know is with very specific training, the effects are, yeah, seem to be very large, but also very specific. Um, in a healthy population where no other system is affected, the muscle strength is reasonable, there's no frailty, etc., then maybe that specific approach can be directly addressed. But of course, in populations with frailty or neurological disease, firstly, especially neurological disease might limit the ability to adapt the motor response, where again, like Shimada, maybe then many more sessions are necessary. Dear candidate, Mr. Krum, the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed. The committee will now withdraw to discuss your, the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. And I request you and your company to await our return here to um, hear about our deliberations. Mr. McCrum, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense, and in view of its positive verdict, and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant to you the degree of doctor. Dr. May has authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction according to Dutch university custom, and I invite you, your supervisor now, to take the floor. Dr. Mayer. Okay, let's start with the formal bit first. Um, by the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Christopher McCrum, the degree of doctor and grant you all the rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university.